and I'm going to pass it off um, to our guest presenter today, uh, Dr. Philip Maddock. I, I did not do that right, but I'm so sorry. Um, but I will be here as needed and we're gonna hand it over to him. Thank you again for joining us. Absolutely, thank you. And thank you for inviting me. So I'm gonna share my screen so everybody can see what we're gonna talk about. Okay, so we're, today we're gonna to talk about shark behavior a little bit, um, how we go about studying that and why it's important to study shark behavior. So when we think about studying sharks, oftentimes we're thinking about scientists that are either hanging over the side of boats or actually in the water with these animals. And this is indeed a large portion of my professional life. Um, but studying sharks also involves deploying equipment into the water and retrieving that equipment and downloading data from that equipment. Um, and also a lot of shark scientists also like to share these experiences with folks that might not get the opportunity to do so on a regular basis. And this can be actually going into the field with these animals and helping with the research, um, going and enjoying an experience with a shark in the water, or potentially going into a classroom or a venue like this and, and sharing information to hopefully increase uh, ocean stewardship. So behavior is any kind of coordinated pattern of activity that's in response to an external or an internal condition or both. Um, and so you can think about an animal that's hungry and it sees its prey um, nearby and it chases after that food and then potentially fends off competitors once it's captured that food. Um, and we study behavior because it's really important in shaping the role that species play both in their natural ecosystems as well as for human use, human use, excuse me. And sharks are really fascinating because of how diverse they are in their behaviors. Um, but these are also really important predators in their respective ecosystems and to, to humans. And recently, over the last 70 plus years, we've seen considerable declines in a lot of different species of sharks across a lot of different regions. And these declines um, coincide with the expansion of industrial fishing um, across lots of different regions of the ocean. And the reports and studies on these declines is numerous. And we're not going to delve deep into this today. Um, but in studying the behavior of animals, we can get a better understanding of why these animals are declining. Um, and also how we can improve our relationship with sharks. So as I mentioned, sharks have a lot of different behaviors that they exhibit. And there's a lot of diversity within those behaviors. So when we think about shark behavior, some of the first things that might come to mind are how do the animals use their habitats? What do they feed on? How do they interact with other animals and their populations? Um, but this also involves movements across ocean basins, uh, avoid being eaten by a predator, uh, giving birth, or learning about their environment and the organisms within it. Um, and just to, to illustrate how diverse these behaviors can be, let's briefly uh, explore feeding and let's just focus on how sharks can feed. Um, and so some species will conceal themselves within their respective ecosystems um, and wait for their prey to, to come within grasp, while others will slowly stalk their prey in the water until they're close enough to strike. Um, some sharks will use filter feeding um, to meet their energetic needs, um, and then others will use the suction power of their mouths um, in order to extract prey from, from hiding places. Um, and these are pretty typical feeding mechanisms that a lot of animals use. Um, but when we start delving deeper into shark feeding behavior, uh, we can see some maybe less characteristic uh, feeding behaviors from other animals that we might think of. And so you can imagine a white shark uh, propelling itself towards the surface of the water for its air breathing prey and breaching the surface of the water, um, or sharks scavenging off of carcasses either that are floating on the surface of the water or at the, the bottom of the ocean. Um, and sharks also can use different appendages in which to stun their prey before they actually capture it. Um, and the diversity of these feeding behaviors uh, goes deeper. Um, some sharks are actually parasites on larger bodied animals, things like marine mammals or other sharks. Um, some sharks like this tasseled wabigong um, will actually use their appendages to lure prey into um, striking distance. Um, and others will use their body to actually um, physically hold the animals before they can uh, disable it. It's like this hammerhead which will pin stingrays to the bottom with its head before they can bite it. 
And so lots and lots of different behaviors. Um, and so one of our goals when we're studying shark behavior is to get a better understanding of these animals from a scientific standpoint, um, but also to get an understanding about how our behavior leads to changes in the behavior of these sharks um, and in turn potentially affects uh, their role within the ecosystem. Um, so before we start delving into the tools that we use to study shark behavior, I figured it might be um, a good moment to just kind of break things up for a minute and answer any quick questions that we might have. No questions? Um, so the question from Brady, what shark behavior have you seen? That surprised you the most? Um, I think one of the most surprising behaviors when you think about um, sharks is how comfortable they are oftentimes um, in being proximate to humans, um, despite the fact that maybe they've had uh, what we would consider maybe a negative interaction with those, with those people recently. And I'm gonna show you a video um, in a little bit that actually shows a shark that we caught and tagged um, two days prior, um, swimming right next to us with no issues. Um, okay, so if we don't have any other questions, we'll move forward. So one of the main aspects of behavior that I want to talk today about is the movement of these sharks through their environments. And studying movements provides us with information on how these sharks use their habitats, um, but also in a lot of different contexts with regards to different behaviors. Uh, and so one of the main ways that we study the movements of sharks is through this method called mark recapture. And so this method um, is, is um, enabled through the capture of an animal um, and then released back into the environment and then recapturing it later, um, oftentimes when the shark is a bit larger. And this method allows us to understand the two plate, the different places that the animal has used since it's been captured um, and the potential habitats in between. And in order to use this method, we need some way to distinguish individuals from one another. And so we can do so uh, using natural markers. This could be the shape of a fin or the coloration of a fin um, or distinct body patterns on an animal. Here we've got a whale shark that we could either potentially visually um, identify across individuals or we can actually use computer software to look into. But when I think about mark recapture, oftentimes I think about implementing some kind of tag either on or in the animal. Um, here we've got a pit tag being inserted into the musculature of a shark. Um, and each of these pit tags has a unique identification code. And then that pit tag can be read by a reader um, here with this picture in the, in the center here. And so if that shark happens to be recaptured by the scientist, um, that person can then determine which individual uh, the shark was. Now, one of the tricks though, is that in order to read these pit tags, you need a special reader. Um, a lot of folks might not have this reader. And so we have a variety of different uh, external tags that we can deploy on these sharks. So here we've got a video of a roto tag being inserted into the dorsal fin of a shark. And this, this roto tag has a unique ID number on it. And it's also got contact information for the scientists. That way, if somebody does happen to catch this shark, they can not only identify that it's been uh, tagged, but also contact the scientists with the information on where it was recaptured. Um, here we've got a shark that we tagged two days prior um, swimming by us, and it's got this Casey tag embedded in its musculature. Um, and similar to the Rota tag, it's got an ID number, it's got contact information. And so we can start understanding the movements and the habitat use of these sharks using this method. Um, but one of the tricks is that we need to recapture these sharks in order for this method to work. And recapture rates are typically less than 5% for sharks. So we're, we're a bit limited in the information we can gather using this method. So we can use a variety of other types of tags in which to actually track the movements of these sharks um, between capture events um, and get a better understanding of how they use different ocean basins. And then we can start addressing questions like how those movements overlap with uh, fisheries and potentially use that information to improve management and identify those areas where sharks are at highest risk. Um, so one of these types of tags that we can use are acoustic telemetry transmitters. And so here we've got a transmitter um, that's about the size of a AA battery that's being inserted into the body cavity of a bull shark. 
And these transmitters range in size, um, and the larger the tag, typically the stronger the signal they emit and the longer the battery life is. Um, and these tags can be uh, deployed externally, like you can see here on the bottom right. Um, but the internal deployment of these tags using a relatively quick surgery um, is oftentimes most effective. Um, and the amazing healing powers of these sharks kind of speaks to the utility of this particular method. And so once this transmitter is um, deployed in this shark, uh, one or more sutures will be used to, to close the wound. And then you can see here in the middle that after just a week's worth of time, um, we can see just a faint line where that incision was made and the suture is starting to loosen and degrade. And then on the right here, we've got a shark that was tagged and recaptured less than a month after it was initially caught. And you can see just a few faint lines on its belly. And so this internal deployment then allows for us to track the movements of these sharks for upwards of 10 years. Now, the shark gets released and the, the tag is in its body cavity and that tag emits a unique sound signal that we can track. Um, and we can do so either actively um, by following the shark with a hydrophone in the water, um, following its movements over relatively short periods of time, or for longer term studies, we can actually deploy mobile hydrophones in the water, these acoustic receivers that you can see here on the bottom right next to this hammerhead. And the idea is that we can deploy these tags, these transmitters inside the shark, and we can also deploy these receivers in different locations where we suspect that they'll use. And every time that the shark swims by that receiver within a certain distance, um, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 500 meters, that signal from the tag is going to be recorded by the hydrophone that receiver, as well as the time period in which it was de detected. And so in deploying a variety of these receivers across different habitats, we can get an understanding of the areas that sharks use more frequently than others. Now, one thing that you'll notice here is that these two bottom images um, show that each of the receivers are attached to the substrate, substrate, either through a chain that's passed through the reef structure on this particular ecosystem or actually um, driven into the substrate here on the bottom right. Um, but we know that a lot of sharks use depths that are too deep for us to scuba dive or free dive to. Um, but we have ways in which we can actually deploy these receivers in deeper waters. Um, here we're in about 300 meters of water and what you're going to notice is that there's a receiver on the top of this buoy and then that buoy is attached to a heavy chain and cinder blocks that are going to anchor it to the bottom of the ocean. And then between that anchor and that buoy is an acoustic release. And that acoustic release is going to allow us in six to eight months of time to go back to this site send a signal to the release and then that will allow the buoy and the receiver to float to the surface for us to download the data. Um, and so this method of tracking sharks is incredibly effective and, and widely used across the world. Um, but one of the caveats or limiting factors that we have is that we need to either be consistently following sharks or we need them to be in the proximity of these receivers in which for us to detect them to be there. Um, and we know that some sharks um, tend to travel very long distances. Um, and for many of these species, we can use satellite tags in which to track their movements over longer distances. Um, and the attachment of these tags varies from being inserted into the fins or the musculature of the sharks, the shape and the size of these tags varies, and the, the function of these tags also varies um, across different devices. But in general, the goal here is to implant a tag into a shark. Here, we've got a satellite tag being inserted into a dorsal fin of a great hammerhead shark. And what you'll notice is that there's an antenna sticking up past the dorsal fin of this animal. And so the goal here is to secure the tag to the shark. And then every time that that shark's fin breaches the water, that satellite tag is gonna communicate with satellites in the area. And we can actually get somewhat real-time tracking data from this shark. And we can then determine if this shark is staying within the confines of the Bahamas and the shark sanctuary that they provide there, or if it starts moving into international waters where it might be at threat to um, potential international fishers. Now, these tags are incredibly useful. They provide information on the areas that the sharks move, how far they're traveling, and some basic um, behavioral information. But it's very difficult using some of these methods to discern what these animals are actually doing in their respective habitats. 
And so we've got some other technology that we can pair with these tags in which to gain some better insight into those behaviors. Uh, one of those technologies is accelerometry. And so similar to if you've got a smartphone, as you turn it, the screen moves based on its orientation. We can deploy accelerometers on sharks in which to understand the movement patterns of these sharks in three-dimensional space. And so not only can we get an understanding of the areas that these sharks use, we can also get an understanding of how they're using those particular habitats. And so we can look at the changes in swimming rates of these sharks to understand when they're going through normal swimming patterns, when they're resting, or if there's periods of increased activity, potentially due to chasing after a prey item or potentially trying to escape a predator. In addition to these accelerometers, we can also use underwater videos as well as above water video to look at the movements of these animals across their habitats. Um, here we have video of a school of black tip sharks off of South Florida. And we can use this video to understand the coordinated movement patterns of these animals within a localized region. And we can also use this to get an understanding of their longer distance movements. Um, and we can coordinate this with information on the environment. Um, here we've got a graph with the orange line representing water temperature. And what we see is that as water temperature increases, we see a decrease in the number of sharks here in black. Um, indicating that as water temperatures get warmer, these sharks are moving northward on their migration along the eastern seaboard of the United States. <clears throat> and in addition to, to these longer distance movements and these broad scale patterns of, of habitat use, we can also get some finer scale habitat use and movement information. And so here, whoops, here we've got the, the same school of black tip sharks may have a great hammerhead and what we'll see in a minute is that the shark is then chasing after these black tips, attempting to capture them for feeding purposes and these black tips are fleeing into the shallow waters where the great hammerhead is less effective and less able to maneuver. And so not only can we use these passive videos to, to get broad scale information on movements, we can also get fine scale behavioral um, understanding of, of these animals as well. Um, and in addition to passively deploying video cameras either above the water or below the water, we can also actively attach these cameras to the sharks themselves. Um, and this then enables us to get a, get a, a better understanding of the behavior that these sharks um, are exhibiting um, in different conditions. We can actually um, see how these sharks are using their environments and how they're interacting with different uh, species within those environments from a first person perspective. Now these these technologies and these tools are pretty well known and probably some of the first things that you might think of when we're studying movements. Um, but there's also some other tools we can use which are maybe less apparent when you'd first think about studying the movements of sharks. Um, the first of these is genetics. And so we can go out and we can take a small tissue sample from um, different sharks and we can get an understanding of how they are mixing from a large scale perspective, which sharks are, are um, within which populations. And so here we've got um, information on taupe sharks in the southern hemisphere and each one of these ellipses on the map, the blue, green, red, yellow, and orange, uh, are indicative of distinct genetic populations. And what this means is that there's not enough mixing of individuals between these populations um, for their genetics to be shared. They're distinct genetically. And we can note the different features that prevent these sharks from mixing. Um, on the left here, the blue and the green population are inhibited by the continents of South America whereas the, the red and the yellow populations are not mixing, likely due to the long distance um, that they would need to travel to do so across the Indian Ocean. And so we can get some kind of broad scale understanding of movements or lack of movements um, across space using genetics. And we can also look at more fine scale movement patterns. Um, here, we've got information on black tip reef sharks out in French Polynesia. And we can use genetics to understand the specific nursery habitats where they give birth. And what we find is that some species repeatedly use the same habitat, similar to a sea turtle, in which it is giving birth potentially uh, an advantage to its young. Um, and we can pair this with things like photo IDs, 
um, here on the right, and we can see the same black tip reef shark based on that distinct marking on its dorsal fin. And we can find periods in which it's pregnant versus not pregnant and identify those areas that it's using at those distinct time periods in its life. And lots and lots of other tools and ways to study the, the movements of sharks. Um, we can set up experiments when we expose them to different situations and see how that lead to them exhibiting different movement patterns. Um, we can collect tissue samples from these animals and look at the chemical composition of those tissues in order to determine what parts of ocean basins they're using. Um, lots of different methods. And oftentimes we, we pair different methods together to get uh, a good understanding of their movements, both at broad scales and at fine scales. Um, and so, before we move on to the next topic, I figure we can um, potentially address some questions um, when we watch this tiger shark. Um, so Carl asks, how do you capture the sharks most of the time? So this is a good question and it's highly variable based on the, the researcher and the type of shark. Um, probably the two main ways in which sharks are caught is through some type of hook and line, whether that is an individual hook attached to um, a weight or attached to a buoy, um, or whether it's a series of hooks that's attached to a line, which you'd call a long line. Um, and this can be set either horizontally at the surface, in the middle of the water, or at the bottom, or it can be set vertically. So we can get an understanding of which sharks are using what part of the, the uh, water column. Um, and then the other method um, would be using some kind of a net. Um, this might be a net that's set out in a particular area um, of interest, and then the the net then entangles the sharks, which can then be uh, retrieved and, and processed. All right, Brady. When you deploy the acoustic buoys and tags, are they battery operated or, or do any of the stationary systems use hydroelectric power? From tidal movements, they were powered, powered by a tidal generator. Would there be a benefit to longer term deployment? So this is a really good question. So to my knowledge, there's no, none of these acoustic receivers that are being powered um, either through water or through the sun. Um, they're all battery operated. And so the tags themselves are all self-contained. There's no way to change out the batteries of those. So there's usually a set time in which they're supposed to, to live for just like any other battery you'd use. Um, and you can predefine how long that battery life is gonna be. And oftentimes it's dictated by um, how frequently the signal is being emitted. The, the more signals emitted per minute, um, the slower the battery, the lower the battery life is going to be. Um, for the receivers themselves, um, they use um, a modified lithium D battery, um, and those batteries will last based on the number of transmissions they get. Um, and so those batteries tend to last somewhere in the neighborhood of about a year. And so when we go and we download the data from them, um, oftentimes we'll check the battery life, and if it's getting low, then we'll change out that battery. So good questions. Okay, so in addition to movements, another main factor to study with regards to shark behavior is what they eat. And so we can use a variety of the methods that uh, I briefly talked about earlier to do so. We can use the accelerometers to see if sharks are chasing after prey. We can use uh, videos, both passive and active, in which to study the, the actual approach of predators and capture of their prey. Um, we can also use different experiments. And so here we've got a video recording the um, capture of prey by a black tip shark um, here, fully, um, a, fully ready to capture its prey. Um, this middle shark here um, has trouble capturing its prey. And the reason is because its electroreception was blocked for this particular experiment. And what we find is that certain senses provide different, um, different um, advantages for it, depending on what aspects of the feeding or the hunting um, part that they're in. And so for longer distances, it tends to be um, smell and sound, but close in, particularly as a shark gets ready to, to capture its prey, electroreception um, plays a really important role telling the shark when it should be opening and closing its mouth. Um, now, one of the, the main ways in which we study what animals eat, including sharks, is looking at what's in their stomachs. Um, and this can be either through some type of forced regurgitation by pumping their stomachs, um, or it can be um, dissecting them and visually identifying what is in their stomach. Um, but if anybody 
um, has experience trying to use stomach contents to identify animal diets. Um, they know that um, some or much of those contents can be partially or highly digested, uh, making it quite difficult. So with the advancement of genetic sequencing, uh, we're actually able to identify more of what these animals are eating, um, giving us more information on their diets. Um, in addition to stomach contents, um, chemical tracers can also be used to study the diets of animals. Here we've got blood being extracted um, from this shark. Uh, we can also collect other tissues like muscle from this shark. And this is based on the premise that you are what you eat. And so as an animal eats something, it's taking those nutrients and it's contributing to either the maintenance or the growth of that animal. And so we can use these different tissues to get an understanding of, of what an animal is eating within its food web. And these different tissues provide different pieces of information based on how frequently they're replaced by the animal. And so it gives us different time scales in which to, to look into the, the diet of these animals. And there's some tissues that can actually provide us with a series of, of information. And so we can look at the vertebra of a shark um, and these sharks lay down bands similar to a tree or to an otolith from a bony fish. And those bands indicate um, different ages of the shark. And we can then take samples from those different rings and it provides us with information on the diet of the shark throughout its lifetime. And we can, we can gather if it's um, changed or if it's stable um, as it grows. And we can begin to use this information to understand uh, what these sharks are eating and how, it, how similar or different it is to other sharks or other predators, and if those diets change in response to some type of internal or external condition. And then we can start pairing this diet information with movement data to really understand how these be behaviors um, interact with one another. And so here we've got the trophic level of these different sharks, so how high up in the food web a shark sits. And then we also have their home ranges, so the, the area that they use, and the darker colors indicating a larger area that these sharks use. What we find is that the sharks that use a larger area tend to be bigger in body size and also tend to sit higher up in the food web. And so in studying these different behaviors, we can get an understanding um, about these sharks and the resources that are important to them, um, and also how our actions interact um, with their behaviors shaping um, their role in keeping ecosystems healthy. Um, and the reason this is important is because we know that as predators decline or are removed from ecosystems, it can have major impacts. Um, here we have the example of wolves in Yellowstone, and we know that when they were removed, um, this led to not only effects on their primary and secondary prey species, but also the ecosystem in general. And a classic example from the ocean are sea otters. Um, and these sea otters are key predators um, out on the west coast of North America. And back in the um, 18th and 19th and 20th century, um, folks harvested them for their fur. And in the early 20th century, um, nearly caused them to go extinct. Um, and with the declines in these sea otters, we saw a release of pressure on their prey species, um, particularly sea urchins. <clears throat> and these sea urchins began to overgraze the kelp forests in which these animals inhabited. And this led to dramatic effects, not only on uh, the kelp itself, but all the organisms that used it for habitat, including crustaceans, seabirds, and fishes. And so we know repeated, repeatedly from different examples that the loss or the removal of predators can have dramatic effects on different ecosystems. And the reason for this is that predators like sharks play important roles in their respective ecosystems. They both feed upon and scare different prey species. They help with nutrient cycling and movements. And they also off, potentially affect the actual structure of the ecosystem itself. Um, and as we see declines in these predators or potential losses, um, the ability for them to recover is going to vary based on their life history characteristics. Um, and sharks tend to take quite a while to recover, um, in part because of their biology. So we can compare the silky shark to a tuna, and its characteristics show us that it takes much longer for it to recover because it takes much longer for these sharks to reach sexual maturity, and oftentimes their offspring output is much lower. 
And so when we think about declines in sharks, we know that part of these are attributed, part of this is attributed to human actions, if not the majority. And there's lots of different human actions that we can consider that either benefit or lead to the detriment of these sharks. And we can just take two of these actions um, and look at their effects on sharks in coral reefs around the world. Um, the, the use of gill nets and long lines in um, fisheries tends to lead to negative impacts on shark species. And so this graph here in the middle right shows that when gill nets are present, we tend to see fewer sharks in those particular reefs. Whereas protecting areas um, through shark sanctuaries actually leads to an increase in our sharks, as we might expect. Um, likely you know of marine protected areas and their importance and the value that they have for um, improving and conserving ecosystem health. Um, but we also have specific areas that are shark sanctuaries in which um, these sharks are specifically protected, protected um, due to their value in the ecosystem. Um, and one of these shark sanctuaries I want to highlight is that in the Bahamas, in which the entirety of the waters of this country are protect, sharks are protected in. Um, they're not allowed to be targeted or harvested for any type of recreational or commercial purposes. Um, and the reason for this is that the Bahamas realizes the um, environmental value that these sharks play but also the economic value that these sharks have, um, which is much greater when they're alive than versus when they're dead. And so these sharks bring in hundreds of millions of dollars to this, to this country through tourism and diving and filming and research. And so as we move forward in thinking about these sharks, um, understanding all the aspects of their biology is critical as we think about uh, the ability of these animals to recover from potential disturbances or to recover from the disturbances that they've already uh, experienced. So I know that we're a little bit over time, um, but if we have any questions, I'd be happy to, to take those um, in the chat box. And these are some silky sharks that we've had the pleasure of swimming with uh, last month in the Bahamas. Um, and as you'll notice, um, they get quite close and quite curious. So Brady asks, so uh, electric senses are blocked for the feeding experiment. Have you observed sharks using electroreceptors to satiate curiosity like a dog nosing around the dirt or being mouthy when they play? Um, so that's a good question. So it's a tricky one to ask um, in part because I've not had the pleasure of doing any kind of experimental work with sharks. All of my experiences are either through natural behaviors or through um, catching them. Um, but what I can say is that um, when we deploy cameras underwater, um, sharks can become pretty curious um, and they may bump the camera with their nose or even have a test bite on that camera. Um, and that's probably because of some of the electrical stimuli that they're experiencing and they don't quite know what it is. Um, same, same deal with any kind of um, metal that goes into the water. Um, the ions from that metal are interacting with the ions in the seawater. Um, and this can cause the sharks to either become curious or it can cause them to, to be a little bit more timid. Any other questions? Uh, Jenny writes, what are you working on right now? What is your current research project? So um, as most scientists, we're kind of in a lot of different phases of different projects. Uh, we just finished up a study on the diets of bull sharks and alligator gars and black tip sharks in Sabine Lake and San Antonio Bay. And we're, we're working on the data to, to get an understanding of how changes in temperature and salinity and food web structure affect their diet and how much they overlap. Um, so we can get an understanding if something changes in the environment, like sea level rise or changes in how much fresh water we're extracting from rivers um, that might change their dynamics. Um, we have quite a few silky sharks tagged out in the Bahamas right now that we're tracking acoustically. Um, and we're also um, tracking some hammerhead sharks using those satellite tags from the video um, that I showed you. Um, home base, so I'm currently a faculty member at Texas A&M Galveston. I uh, started here a couple years ago and then before that was at Sam Houston State University. 
Um, and then also want to give a shout out to Saving the Blue, um, which is a nonprofit I work with. Um, and you should definitely, if you, if you are interested, check them out at savingtheblue.org. Uh, we offer experiences for folks to, to get to interact with these sharks. Any other questions? Um, are you working with TPWD on this project? So um, we were working with TPWD on the, the project in Sabine Lake and in San Antonio Bay. And in fact, I was over in Port Arthur at their office uh, last Friday um, doing some dissections of some fish and some sharks. So they are, they are part of some of the work that we're doing and they've become really valuable partners um, for me um, since I moved here a few years ago. Um, do you do more work with sharks in the Gulf or in the Bahamas? I'm an incoming MARB student, very interested in undergrad shark research, anything I can do to prepare. Um, so Texas A&M actually um, hired me just specifically to teach. Um, and so I'm not um, a research faculty here um, in the university. Um, and so I do do research, um, but oftentimes it's in collaboration with other partners. Um, but my suggestion for you, if you're interested in getting involved in shark research, um, if you're a new undergrad student, is to, to stop by or send me an email um, so we can chat. And then to also talk with Dr. Dave Wells. Um, he also studies sharks um, and we can either hope uh, to provide you with some opportunities or get you in contact with folks that do. Um, I know some of our undergraduate students are, are finishing up their um, their internship with Coastal Fisheries and some of the other um, TPWD divisions. Um, and those experiences are pretty invaluable and accessible to, to our students here at, at Galveston. Um, and then also just kind of stay curious. I know that this is Shark Week, so, you know, watch those shows, see some of the cool stuff they're, they're doing, um, and just kind of keep, keep staying curious. Um, how do alligator gar and shark research intersect? So good question. So I didn't talk anything about teleos bony fishes today, um, in part because we're in shark week. Um, but alligator gars, um, if you're familiar with them, um, are these really large bodied fishes um, that have really gnarly mouths with two rows of teeth. Um, and so both alligator gars and some of the coastal sharks um, serve as top predators in our ecosystem. So you can think about them filling a, a very similar role. Um, but what we find is that they, they don't necessarily eat the same things and they don't use the same habitats. And so they're, they're complementary to each other. Um, and alligator gars have the ability to move between fresh water and salt water, um, but they generally don't persist in salt water for long periods of time. Whereas if you think about some of our sharks on the coast, um, they tend to be in more salty waters, but they may be able to move into some, some upstream areas um, for short periods of time. Um, and then bull sharks have the capacity to move between both. Um, and so one of the really interesting aspects of the project um, that we just wrapped up is um, looking at how the, the diets of alligator gars, bull sharks, and black tip sharks actually interact and overlap. Um, and what we're seeing is that the alligator gars tend to be um, the, the top dogs in kind of the lower salinity waters of that ecosystem versus the, the shark species tend to be the top predators in those lower stretches of the estuary. Very good questions. Anything else? Okay, well, um, if that is all, um, I'm happy to, to chat with folks or address more questions if you want to send me an email. Um, emails on the bottom there. You can also just Google, Google me um, or go to the um, Texas A&M Galveston Marine Biology page. Um, thank you for TPWD for, for giving me this platform to share some of the work we're doing. Hopefully everybody enjoyed it. Thank you so much again for joining us today. We appreciate it a ton.